Dr. Sarai Stansik, thank you so much for joining us on the Plant Trainers podcast today. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be with both of you. It's a great pleasure to be with you as well. We've been waiting for this for a very long time, and we would love to know if you have a moment of gratitude to share with us and the listeners. Well, I want to offer gratitude to my very loving and supportive family. I'm very fortunate to have an amazing husband and children that um, have really been um, have carried me through some difficult times, and I'm grateful to them. I also am grateful uh, in recent news that this COVID-19 pandemic, um, we're seeing some movement in the positive direction. I think yesterday the Wall Street Journal said there was a 77% reduction in new cases. So that is a blessing and certainly something for us to offer gratitude today. Definitely. And we are recording this a couple of weeks earlier. So we're about mid well, no, we're the end of February now. It's a short month, but hopefully by the time this gets to listeners' ears, that, that stat will be increased even more or at least consistent. Yes, even better. Even better. And exactly. a lot of that progress is because of all the frontline workers like you and all the other doctors and nurses out there. So we should thank Are you there? Oh, you did we you froze? froze on, you froze too. Okay, are you back? I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was weird. Yeah, that was weird. Okay, at least we're here. That's totally fine. We're all good. Um so why don't you bring us back a little bit and let us know how you found a plant-based lifestyle and what you experienced when you decided to embrace it? Yeah, so uh, you know, I'm an infectious diseases uh, specialist internist, um, and so how is it that I became this uh, passionate advocate of plant-based nutrition and lifestyle medicine? Well, it largely uh, stems from uh, a diagnosis in 1995 as a young medical resident. Uh, in the midst of a very busy on-call in the hospital, I awakened to find that I couldn't feel my legs, and, and that acutely... Um, it's interesting because just an hour before I was running around the hospital, I took a nap, I woke up and couldn't feel my legs. I ended up in the emergency room with a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. And, and that really put me on a path um, as a chronic disease patient, um, really struggling uh, and suffering through uh, this, this diagnosis ultimately leading to a point in my life about eight years into the disease um, that I was dependent on 12 medicines and I was walking with a cane and really, really struggling. Um, and then by chance, I came across a publication that discussed the connection between multiple sclerosis and diet. And I was struck by this because here I was a dual board certified attending physician and I knew nothing about nutrition, which is remarkable. Um, and so this was the catalyst that, that really drove this interest in wanting to understand these connections. Um, and uh, I just delved into the literature and, and just consumed anything that was related to these connections. And, and that really extended into not just diet, but lifestyle, exercise, stress, sleep, all of these variables that were yet so incredi incredibly important, yet had not been discussed or covered during all my training, um, 10 years of my life, you know, it was four years of medical school, four years of residency, and then another two years as a resident, as a, as a fellow rather. And, uh, I had never learned these connections. So to me, it was an exciting period. And as I learned more and more, and I, you know, it was, it was a, a journey of empowerment. And as I, I started to introduce these um, behavior modifications into my own life, I, I started to reap extraordinary benefit and um, I started to feel better. Uh, and I was able to taper off of every one of those medicines and ultimately crossed uh, the finish line at a marathon. And that was a very special day for me, Shoshana, because um, it wasn't just that I had run a marathon, but it was that all the changes that I had implemented in my life had, had borne fruit. Uh, and I realized the power that lies in lifestyle and, and how important this therapeutic intervention, this tool I had in my toolbox that was really um, quiescent because I didn't, as a, as a physician, it wasn't part of the armamentarium that we were trained in. So uh, I realized then that it was, of course, very special that it had 
changed the course of my life, but I needed to now share this. And so um, in 2003, as an infectious disease physician, um, and then, you know, introducing the changes into my life, by 2011, I decided that I needed to leave behind infectious diseases, um, a field that I had been practicing in for 16, 17 years because I felt compelled to do what I what I could personally to disseminate this all important message. And so that's what's led to um, the, the film Code Blue and the book What's Missing from Medicine. And you can understand why I've, I chose that title. Uh, because it's and my clinical practice and all the work that I've done over the you know the past decade has really been in an effort to disseminate this all important message because I think we can you know save so many lives and improve the quality of life of Americans across the country and and beyond and you know this is this is really a global effort. We talk about the power of food so often on this podcast, and we talk to people that have transformations and life changing moments and. I'm curious to know others with multiple sclerosis, is that pretty typical that if they change their nutrition, their results will change for the better? Does that happen with most of them? Well, uh, you know, there's a spectrum in multiple sclerosis. It depends when you introduce the change, how much damage has been done. But here's the thing, um, this uh, idea of lifestyle medicine and plant-based nutrition is going to serve all of us regardless of where we are. Um, I, I, I would not say that because we don't have the, the clinical studies yet to speak to this uh, conclusively, but um, it, it, I can tell you that I have seen a lot of patients with multiple sclerosis and we've talked about introducing lifestyle modification and anecdotally I've seen so many flourish. Um, but you know, in science we have to do, we have to conduct clinical studies in order for us to speak conclusively. But I would say that, you know, I, I have patients who come to see me um, because they're newly diagnosed multiple sclerosis. And often this is a disease that we see in women and in young women. It's typically diagnosed early in, in life. And so I might see a 30-year-old or a 40-year-old with newly diagnosed MS. Uh, and But the thing is that some of them come in and they're also obese. They're also hypertensive. They're also hypercholesterolemic. And so the wonderful thing about this prescription is that when we address lifestyle, we're not only improving uh, outcomes in MS, but we're also improving outcomes in all those other uh, chronic diseases that I just listed. And also we're reducing risk of breast cancer, we're reducing risk of Alzheimer's disease. So this is the beauty of this approach. Um, it serves to raise the, um, that veil of fatigue that is so common in MS. It offers us uh, a solution to the anxiety and depression that we often live with. Uh, so I, I think that's what's most exciting about lifestyle medicine and why it's so um, exhilarating to share the message because it's it uh, it's infectious, it's contagious. And the wonderful other piece is that when we feel better, um, it, it everyone around us um, is attracted to that and they want to learn more about what you're doing. And I, I often have patients who I see the daughter, the mother and the grandmother uh, because they all want to learn. And then we have family units that change. And that's really what this is. It's about um, continuing. And thank you for the work that you do with your podcast and serving to, to um, raise this issue of awareness. Because every time uh, someone signs on to your podcast and learns about plant-based nutrition and learns about optimal lifestyle, um, that's yet another person that we've avoided that terrible journey, that path that we see so commonly in our country. You know, as a, I, as a physician, putting aside my chronic disease hat as an MS patient, I mean, I've been practicing medicine for 27 years. And in that capacity, I have seen so much pain and suffering that I know is largely preventable. So many uh, days at the, uh, you know, going to the nursing home at, at the end of my day and doing consults on patients with dementia and, you know, status post stroke or status post heart attack and knowing that we could have prevented this. And um, it is a missed opportunity. It has been a missed opportunity. I think the good news is that so many physicians now uh, are evolving and gaining this awareness the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is growing near exponentially. More and more doctors are 
learning uh, about this, and we are fighting to create uh, a, a shift in paradigm. We want all doctors to learn this when they're training in medical school. So part of my passion and my commitment to this change is to create uh, an interest in modifying the curricula in medical schools and health professional schools so that all individuals who are practicing in the healthcare setting are able to um, to understand the power that lies in lifestyle because it's not just about changing individuals but it's assuring that the healthcare system changes as well and speaks to this. Absolutely, and I think that's part of. I mean, you talked about having the podcast and you talked about doctors' perspectives and all of that. And when Adam was diagnosed with his tumor eleven year eleven years ago already. Um, he found a plant-based lifestyle on his own and it was devastating for us. I was pregnant with my daughter. They told me to prepare, to get prepared because anything could happen at any moment and I might need to raise my kids on my own. And he went ahead and he did that on his own. And within a year, we saw that tumor shrink. We saw his heart disease go away and he wasn't obese. You know, we were, we were athletic. He wasn't obese, but the doctors, both doctors churned and looked at us and said, oh, well, it can't be your diet. There must have been some other kind of something out there. You were in Mexico smoking something or you did a trial study in the States, right? They, they weren't accepting of it. And that's when we decided that we needed to create the podcast to prevent as many people as possible going through the devastation that we were going through. It, it affected us. It, it still affects us because of mental health, right? PTSD, all of that. And we just wanted to help as many people as possible get the information, not ever go down that road. And if they were already down that road, which a lot of people were, give yeah. them the tools to come out. But it didn't matter if it was a tumor or heart disease or MS. We were covering all bases, the foundation, yeah. the foundation of all bases all at the same time. And I really do hope that today that same doctor... Um, has a better understanding of plant-based nutrition and accepts it and recognizes it and is hopefully recommending it. I hope so. And, and um, yeah, and by no fault of his or her own, I mean, this is the, the problem is that I, I, and I talk about this in, in code blue. Um, I blame the medical schools who, who have uh, been negligent in speaking to, I mean, there's, there's ample evidence in the literature in peer reviewed medical literature that speaks to the importance of nutrition and its effect on the disease genesis and 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 um, and they have not effectively conveyed that message. I think there's a lot of interest in creating change. There are medical schools that are doing that already. If you saw Code Blue, we featured a medical school in the film that is, ba is built on the principles of lifestyle medicine, uh, which is an amazing accomplishment, and it should be um, the the way we we move forward in regards to. Uh, it should be the playbook, right, for future medical schools, and um, other medical schools should mimic what they've done because they've been so successful. I mean, I I had the wonderful opportunity of visiting the school several on several occasions and speaking to medical students that are in attendance, and you can. It is such a different experience from what I had uh, in that everything that they do is embedded in the principle. I mean, they, they have culinary medicine. Um, they create an environment where they uh, include uh, advice on physical activity every day for the students themselves. They start their, their day with a little bit of meditation in the lecture hall. So everything that they're creating in that setting is speaking to health. Uh, we, when we go to medical school, we learn, uh, and the way medical school curricula are built is on this idea of pathogenesis. We learn the disease state. We become really good disease detectives. Uh, you know, we take thorough histories and physicals and we draw labs and we do imaging studies ultimately to make a diagnosis. And then once we have the diagnosis, we treat with a pharmaceutical agent, a procedure or a surgical intervention. That's pathogenesis. But the mirror image of that is salutogenesis which is the study of health and wellness. And we don't learn anything about that. It's like half of the human health continuum is completely ignored in medical school. Is there any transition though? Sorry to interrupt. Is there any transition in the medical schools to 
move away from the pathogenics and look into the underlying cause of all these issues so that they could actually treat what the problem is rather than just medicate and deal yep. with the symptoms? Yes, that's the trend right now. That's what's so incredibly exciting is that there are medical schools, there are leaders, there, there are deans uh, that are um, running these medical schools that see that there's a gap and there's a lapse. Uh, we, we're doing a lot of great things in medicine. I mean, think about all the advances, uh, even in the COVID-19 pandemic, the fact that we have how many vaccines now in less than a year, that's amazing that we have the, the technology and expertise and uh, to create um, solutions. But this chronic disease epidemic, the background on which, think about it, one one in every two of us in, in this country is living with at least one chronic disease. 70% of us are obese or overweight. If you're normal weight in the United States, you're in a minority. Uh, the CDC tells us that by 2050, 30% of us will be living with diabetes. That's crazy. It's unsustainable, but that's the path that we're on. And the solution to the problem is not developing yet another drug to treat diabetes or yet another drug to treat, you know, hypercholesterolemia. The solution is, is really quite simple. It really is. But nobody wants to believe that the solution could be so simple. It is. It's really this simple. We need to eat primarily plants. We need to move every day. We can't sit and just, you know, watch one television show after another on Netflix, which is what many of us are doing now in the midst of this pandemic. We're sitting on the couch. We have to get up and we have to move. We have to find a reason to get up and move. We have to um, change our perspective, how we uh, interpret stress in our life. We need to learn how to sleep properly, free of all the, you know, so many people are addicted to hypnotics like Ambien or whatever, using alcohol or some, some agent to sleep, and, and, and that's not effective sleep. Um, and alcohol and drug abuse, and these are all issues that are, that are important, and they need to be addressed. But when we optimize all of these aspects, we, we know we can prevent 80% of disease, and we know we can live life to the fullest free of, chron of chronic disease. We have the capacity to do that. I, you know, I say this in my book, and I say it all the time, but it's true. My hope is that each and every one of us, you know, at age 95, 102, whatever that last day, that last day on planet Earth that you spend it surrounded by your family, friends, lovingly. And then that night you go to bed and you pass away peacefully. Not what we see today where people suffer in a nursing home for the last six months to two years or whatever. You know, we can avoid that. We can avoid that. And and it, the solution is is this very simple plant-based lifestyle. And it's incredibly powerful. Definitely. And, and so much good good information there. And I almost want to tell everybody to rewind and, and listen to that again or, you know, send that to their doctors, send that to people they know. And so in terms of Code Blue that came out May 2020, what was what it was actually really interesting. I'm, I'm sure you didn't plan it that way for it to launch at that time, but it was a, a good time to launch when people were kind of paying a little bit closer attention. What was the message that you really, really wanted people to hear? It was a message of empowerment, right? That we can all do this. I, and certainly the film tells my story, um, but it's, and it also tells the story of some of my patients. And, and I think, the, again, the point is that we can we can all implement these changes in our lives and they can be incredibly powerful but be, beyond that i wanted to tell the story of the lapse in medical education and the lapse in in the way physicians practice medicine uh, how this is completely ignored that the solution to every problem is always developing yet another drug to treat that problem but we don't we're not drilling down and, and addressing the root causes right so um, when I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis as a young woman, certainly the fact that I was a medical resident not sleeping very much, wor working 24, 36 hour shifts, I was highly stressed. I was eating primarily out of a vending machine because what's open at three o'clock in the morning when you're in the hospital, right? Um, 
I mean, it was the perfect storm to, to create and feed my genetic predisposition. So I developed multiple sclerosis. Um, and so I think that there's been this misunderstanding, Shoshana, for many, many years, decades, even in medical school, that we are sort of defined by our genes, that we have a genetic predisposition and, and there's nothing we can do about it, that we're, in def we're definitely going to develop diabetes or we're definitely gonna, going to develop breast cancer or we're definitely going to develop multiple sclerosis, that this is encoded in our genetic makeup and we can do nothing about it. And that's not true, right? There's this science uh, called epigenetics that tells us that gene expression is dependent on outside variables. That is just because you have a gene that predisposes you to diabetes doesn't necessarily mean that that gene will be turned on, right? So genes are like a light switch, we can turn them on or off. And epigenetics tells us that there are certain variables that are really important in regards to what genes get turned on or off. And it's things like diet, exercise, stress, sleep, alcohol, smoking, lifestyle medicine, right? So the beautiful thing here is that the film is telling you essentially that you're in control. We're putting the reins back in your hands that you can do this. Now you can choose to or not, but it's available to all of us. And so, but if the, the missing piece is that our doctors are not talking about this. So if, if a patient is going to, to their internist or their endocrinologist and the cardiologist, and they're not even offering this as a possibility, as an option, then it falls on deaf ears and, and, it, and, and it, you know, it, it, it creates uh, no change. I think the good news again is that the world is changing. There's a there's a palpable shift in the field of medicine. More and more physicians are becoming aware and um, are creating change in their practice. And the good news is that medical schools are are catching on, and they're introducing this into the curricula. And so we're seeing a new breed of young physicians that I can tell you. Uh, so many of my medical students are amazing and eager to get out there and and redefine the healthcare experience and that's really where my focus is right now is redefining reimagining what the healthcare experience should be so that we can create happy happy and healthy patients that live to their potential imagine if we all felt well if we all felt if we all got up in the morning and felt energized um, symptom free medication free, imagine the potential each and every one of us could achieve. I think that's mind boggling. Are you getting any pushback from the medical community at all? I'm thinking like the older doctors are probably not ones that wanna redo all their education and they wanna now change what they're doing. And so um, um, there must be some pushback. There is pushback, but I think the, the pushback, um, uh, I'm seeing less and less of it. I think, uh, be, and the reason why, and you know what, pushback is healthy because there are, this is true, there are people out there that are peddling um, bad science, right? So as a physician and a scientist, it's really important to be, to have a little bit of, um, you know, to be skeptical and assure that um, what you're speaking of is scientifically and, and, and you know, um, sound. So uh, I think that, yes, there have been, um, there's been pushback, but the evidence is is so much so that you can't ignore it anymore. You know, it's, it's become mainstream. Like the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, their most recent uh, practice guidelines for diabetes, uh, I believe they were updated in December of 2020. Now for diet, it recommends a plant-based diet in, in the American uh, Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, which is amazing because you can't ignore it anymore. The, the, the studies are there and, and the data um, is incontrovertible. And so I think as, as the data and the science uh, flourishes, it, it, it's going to bring more into the fold. But yes, of course, there are those people, as there are everywhere, that will resist until they die. <laughs> and, and that's okay. Um, 
they're going to miss out on the, the good benefits of this party that we're all attending. So, right. uh, but I think I think the dinosaurs will will move on, and there's new blood coming in, and it's very positive energy. And 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 by the way, let me just say this: it's not that, and I never say this. It's not that I don't think um, medications are important. I think they are. I mean, I'm an infectious disease doctor. Where would we be without antibiotics? Think about it. I started um, in the field of infectious diseases because um, when I was a medical student in the late 80s, early 90s, it was the height of the HIV epidemic. And where I went to medical school in Newark, New Jersey, um, we were we had two wards of AIDS patients. And at that time, we had no treatment. We could just treat their opportunistic infections, but we, we didn't have anything to combat the virus. And you think about in the span of my career, we've gone from a death sentence with HIV positivity to a disease now that is primarily a chronic disease, uh, and we can treat it with the medications that we, I mean, obviously the, the, the goal here is to cure or to prevent, but for those living with HIV positive, you know, that are HIV positive, we can treat it, which is amazing. Um, and there's a, there are a lot of medications that play an important role, but whenever we can, we want to try to reduce dependency on medications, and if at all possible, we want to prevent the event from occurring at all, right? Primary prevention should be our goal, and that's another, you know, um, disappointment in medical school. When I was in medical school, I took a preventive medicine class, but you know what it was all about? It was about Make sure you get your mammogram. Make sure you get your colonoscopy. Make sure you get your PSA. That's not primary prevention. That's early detection. So many doctors use that as prevention. Colonoscopy is not a preventive study. I mean, it's early detection. Primary prevention is not ever developing that polyp that leads to the cancer, right? And when we, the way we prevent that disease is by eating a fiber-rich plant-based diet and exercise, all the things we talk about in lifestyle medicine and and that's the huge part it's the way that it's been taught which makes the doctors think in the mindset that they are and i wonder for some of these dinosaurs who haven't received their invitation to the party or they've received their invitation to the party but they put it in the garbage i wonder how many of them have come in contact with the information but have dismissed it and haven't even committed it to memory like for example adam's doctor will or doctors i should say will they remember that he said to them i went plant-based for a year that's why and they both said to him no like they, they they dismissed it but when they but when they show up and they have their own health issue and all of a sudden it's important to them on a different level and then it happens to come at the right time how many doctors are switching over then and that's always something very interesting to me. I hear you. I hear you. Uh, you know, in my practice, I, I, I've mentioned this before, I had um, about uh, 40 to 50 patients who were also doctors. And the, the way that they became my patient is because we had a patient in common. Like we had a diabetic who had come to see me uh, and we were able to reverse their diabetic state. And then their endocrinologist calls me and says, what did you do? How, how does, you know, how's Mary's diabetes like reversed and then we would have a conversation about lifestyle medicine and and the key was to send them the literature so i would i would say give me your email address i'm going to send you some some literature and then they because again uh, medicine and the way we're trained is is always about the is there the science to support the assertion uh and once we got over that hump the next call i would receive would be dr stancic I want to come see you. And I'm thinking as a colleague, we'll have a cup of tea. No, no, no. I want to see you as a patient because I'm struggling with my weight, struggling with depression, and I need to see you. And and that was um, something that I had never predicted when I started the practice. Um, but it was truly uh, rewarding because I knew when I supported that patient, I mean, every patient that I care for is a privilege and an honor. But when I have a patient who's also... A doctor or a healthcare professional, get them healthy. All of a sudden, I know that that's going to change the way he or she practices medicine, and it's going to affect every one of their patients. And that's going to pay it forward. Yeah. And then that's how you can affect three hundred more people by just affect by by just interacting with that one, which is which is huge. So keeping that in mind, when you wrote um, 
what's missing from medicine, six lifestyle changes to overcome chronic illness. Were you writing it for the person with chronic illness or were you writing it for the, the doctor? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, my, my publisher would say I was writing it for the person with chronic illness and I would say I'm writing it for the doctor too. <laughs> I, th I think um, I almost, I would love to give every medical student day one when they walk into um, their first class and give them a copy of the book that they carry in with them um, because I know that they're not going to learn it uh, in medical school and at least not right now. Uh, and I and again, the messages that are in the book are very simple and very straightforward. Um, it, it, it's not um, understanding the pathophysiology of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. I mean, you know, that can get complicated. There's a lot of things in medicine that are very, very complicated. This is not. This is pretty straightforward. But I think, again, our mindset is the solution to a complicated problem must be complex. Sometimes that's true. In this scenario, this complex chronic disease epidemic that we have created, I call it the man-made epidemic in the book. I know people don't like that, but that's the truth, and I always speak the truth. Um, it is a man-made epidemic, so it can be uh, an undone man-made epidemic, but we need to implement these changes. We need to have serious conversations, honest conversations about what we're consuming. You know, what we're, we're addicted to these phones, we're addicted to, um, Social media, we spend a lot of time, uh, and, it, and it affects our sleep. It takes time away from our family. It takes time away, community, right? Part of, of lifestyle medicine is our relationships. That's medicine, we know that. We know people who have more connections and who, who are social live longer. There's a reason for that. You know, I talk about that in the book. Uh, and everything, and I, I use the, the analogy of a wheel, when I describe lifestyle medicine, the wheel has six spokes and it's diet and ex diet, exercise, stress, sleep, uh, substance abuse issues, and then social connections. And the reason I use the wheel is because they're all interconnected. They all rely on one another. Some of us are really good at food or some of us are really good at exercise. But when we, when we address all of those parameters simultaneously, that's when we achieve what I call the sweet spot, when you gain the greatest benefit. So I, I think that's an important point to make. You can't like be great with your diet, you know, run six miles every day and then drink a bottle of wine every night. That doesn't work. And a lot you of know? people will say, oh, I run so that I can drink. I run so I can eat. So I, I know. I, I've had many patients who run marathons and then eat cheeseburgers and smoke a cigar. And then they have a heart attack when they're 50 and they wonder why. This, I'm telling you why, you know, stress does a lot of damage. So if you're, you know, again, you're eating well and you're, and you're running every day and you're, you know, your, your fitness is, but then you have this job that you work at 85 hours and you're miserable and you hate your boss and you, and you hate everything about it. That is doing a lot of damage. So we have to look at every aspect of our lifestyle. It's not just our food and it's not just, because again, I see this all the time, Shoshana, where I have patients who are, you know, they come in, they're super strong, six pack abs, right? They look awesome. They're, they're you know, a, a, an accident waiting to happen, really just a ticking time bomb. Their insides so, don't match their outsides. They don't, and and we see this we see this often, and so it's really about um, taking a moment to reflect and and addressing all aspects of lifestyle and and you know mindfulness, um, and and really addressing some of these issues can be can be tough because we're you know we're sort of as we. You know, most of my patients are in their fourth, fifth, sixth decade of life, and they've been doing what they've been doing for a very long time. We fall into these, you know, behaviors, and it's very difficult to break them and to start anew. Um, and so it is lifestyle medicine in that respect is a challenge because creating uh, change can always be uh, a challenge, particularly in the world in which we live, where everything uh, in our environment is flowing against optimal lifestyle, right? I mean, you get into your car and you, you, you get on the road and you hit, I don't know, 13 
14 different fast food restaurants or we have the ease of, you know, um, everything's on television. And, and, and so we, we end up being very sedentary, right? So the world that we live in creates an environment so that it's anti-lifestyle medicine, but we have to become very mindful and, and assure that we're practicing all of these parameters on a daily basis. I love the using the, the spokes of the wheel. And I think that not every person is going to have a balanced wheel. Like the spokes are not going to be exact. And I guess it would depend on the individual as far as which one to start with. Like, how do you decide which lifestyle change to make first? And I guess you would look at the wheel and its balance. Is that what happens? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it's a good approach. I mean, in the book, what I what I describe in the first, I, I guess this the when we first get past um, the introduction is really an assessment. So there's some questions that you need to ask yourself, and they may be tough questions, and you have to be honest to yourself. And I ask people to pick up, uh, uh, you know, a little journal and just write down your answers when you start. And again, you have to be honest. Sometimes um, it's hard for us to share with someone else, but between yourself and your journal, write the truth. And it's, um, and when we, and when we do that, when we're honest with ourselves and we're mindful, we can, we can begin to construct something that's appropriate. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to change everything overnight, because I have to tell you that people who go about it that way often fail. You know, it's not about changing everything overnight or saying, oh, I'm bad, because I, that's another thing that we do, which I hate. You know, you have two good days and then maybe you, you make a decision retrospectively, you wish you had done better. And then there's this like, I'm bad. Or now that I've done this, I'm going to give up. No, I mean, listen, celebrate those mistakes. That's what I do. Whenever I make a mistake, I celebrate it because it causes me to stop and realize, you know, how did I get there? What led to my making that bad decision? And then I learn from it so that next time when I'm in that same situation, oh, remember what happened last time when I, I have a solution to the problem? I'm going to be forward thinking and I'm going to create um, uh, a solution to the problem before it occurs. I think there's uh, I think we need to be kinder to ourselves. We're so hard on ourselves and um, love. You, you know, the things we tell our children to be kind and, and, and giving and generous to others, um, we need to do that for ourselves, right? And and we need to place ourselves for us as as women who, particularly, um, you know, as we're always, uh, you know, this idea of being the maternal one and and caring for everyone in our family. But you know, the truth is that you really need to care for yourself first, because when you do that, you're going to be your best self, and you're going to be able to care for everyone else in your family. So I I think some of those. Um, uh, n not being so so hard on ourselves, being kinder and um, and forgiving ourselves when things don't go perfectly. I think those are important lessons too. Absolutely, and looking at it as a percentage. So if you were only doing things twenty percent of how you wanted it to be two yeah. weeks ago, and and you know now you're at eighty percent. Like yeah. we, we, we do need to really look at the positive. If somebody want, if somebody hasn't seen Code Blue yet or wanted to pick up um, a copy of your book, What's Missing from Medicine, where can they find those two? So um, you can go, I think the best place to go to is probably my website. It's drstancic.com and, and it's sort of the website splits up into the book and the film, but um, the film is found on Amazon, on Apple, Google Play. I mean, just about every platform, uh, Vudu, Vimeo, um, there, you can find it there. Uh, but drstancic.com will take you to, to both. Uh, same thing with the book, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, just, just about most independent bookstores, you, you'll be able to find it. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the book came out in January and I'm really proud of it because, it, uh, I put a, I put about 18 months of my life into writing that book. I had no idea what writing a book is, but it's a lot of work. I have a wonderful publisher, um, who really supported me through the process. But, uh, I think the book, um, is just a very honest conversation between myself and the reader. That's all it was meant to be. Um, it is uh, backed by science, but it's not meant to be a scientific text. It's not meant to be uh, heavy. It's meant to be a conversation 
that I would have with you uh, in my office. And um, I hope that it serves whoever reads it and to introduce, benef you know, some benefit into their life. And because, as I said, I think we can we can all reap these benefits and and live life to the, our greatest potential and um, enjoy our families. And as I said, that last day, let it be that you know, you define the parameters of that last day. And um, I think that that's really my hope for all of us. If our listeners wanted to reach out to you on social, uh, connect or follow, where would you like them to go? Well, uh, you can connect through my website or, um, I mean, I'm on all the social platforms, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a huge social media person, but somebody will respond to you and um, get it to me. Okay, we'll put links to all that in our show notes at planttrainers.com. Dr. Stancic, thank you so much for being with us on the Plant Trainers podcast. It's amazing that you went from being a doctor of infectious disease to now being one that is managing and dealing with infectious healing and all the work that you're doing. We're so grateful for it. Thank you so much for being here. We really, really appreciate you. Thank you so much. It was a great pleasure. Thank you.